Yeah, so as uh, Bill said, uh, we got interested in looking at uh, the changes in behavior of brown grass and barley grass. Essentially because of the feedback that we were getting from growers and advisors like yourself, who, who were basically saying that in their experience, it seems to be escaping the early uh, lockdown control and they were getting more and more coming up in their crops. And we really wanted to see whether that was just, uh, well, how much, how much truth was there, I guess, in uh, what was being seen. Because there can be many reasons why uh, some wheat species might be uh, becoming more, more problematic. Uh, before I get into it, I'll acknowledge uh, the young guys uh, who have worked with me on this project, Sam Kleeman for work on Rome grass, and Ben Fleet for uh, working with me on, on uh, barley grass. And I also acknowledge our funding body, uh, GRDC, uh, for funding, funding this research. Okay, so if we think about it, uh, we can survive uh, in our farming systems through two main strategies. Uh, the first one being uh, that they become tolerant or resistant to the selection agent we're using and most in our modern farming system the selection agent of note, I guess, is, is herbicides. And we all know of herbicide resistance being a real problem uh, through our uh, weeds in, in, in Australia. And we have invested a lot of effort uh, ourselves and uh, many researchers in this country in looking at this problem. The one we haven't really focused on is the second one, which is that are these weeds essentially avoiding some of these early control tactics by being selected for this modified behavior, if you want to put it. The main method we have used to control these weeds has been the use of knockdowns or an activity. You know, both of them occur very early in the season. And you could well imagine if the weed selects a mechanism by which it postpones its germination to much later period, well, it's going to escape that control tactic. And that's, that's the thesis that I'm going to put to you and show you the evidence that it's not. This is what I say, and believe me, uh, but I'll show you evidence that that indeed is the case, that our farmers have very effectively selected for these weeds to germinate later and later in the season because there is an, an advantage in, in, in it for them for germinating later because they survive the early control tactics. So as uh, Bill said, uh, you know, there, there have been many reports of this increase in uh, these weed species. Uh, some have said, well, it could simply be that our farmers are planting our crops earlier and earlier, which means there is less time for weeds to germinate before the knockdown. So that could be a reason. Or it could be that uh, diversity of crops in these dry areas where barley grass particularly is a problem is pretty low. So we're largely growing cereals because they're safe crops, and uh, but we have less options uh, for control uh, of, of those weeds. But the third one, which is really what excites me as an ecologist or biologist, I guess, is that are these weeds actually doing something completely differently? And that's what I'll basically spend my time in the next uh, 10 minutes or so. So this is what this brome grass generally does. This is Bromus diandrus, uh, this tall brome that in the past used to basically hang around the fence lines. You know, you get a bit of rain, the heads get heavy, they will droop, and you can just see these heads sort of wobbling around out there. Now, it tended to have very little dormancy, and even if you collect it from fence lines, it still behaves the same way. Rains in autumn will bring it up in a big flush, and most of the germination has finished by about end of April in a normal season. Okay. Which means there's virtually nothing left later on. So if you kill that, there is going to be almost a clean crop with very little brown grass. Now I was at a, a, a consultant meeting in Victoria a few years ago where one of the consultants there said, well, I think our brown grass is actually germinating later and later. We didn't have any evidence for it, but I generally have a lot of confidence in the observation power of farmers and also Consultants. So, you know, if people say that, you don't ignore it. I said, easy for us will be if you send me, just post me the seed of these populations and we can check it out. And one of his populations does this. So you can put it in, uh, uh, you know, test the germination or breakdown of dormancy over time. And if you do it at normal autumn kind of temperature, about 20 degree, 10 degree uh, 20 degree maximum, 10 degree minimum, yeah, we only got about 25% of seeds germinating, even in August. 
So it obviously was a highly Norman population and the fact that it differed from the fence lines, even though th these fence lines are from a different location, you know, we had a little bit of, a, of an evidence that things were starting to behave quite differently out there. But to prove it more conclusively, what you are, need is a fence line here, an in-crop population in the same field, so, which means they've been selected under the same climate, and if they still behave the same, you know it's likely to be due to management. And that's what we've done in this last season, and I'll just show you one example. We have several of these pairs, and this is a population which comes from a place called Warner Town in South Australia, and what Sam did was collected this population from the fence line, and then he went into the paddock 20 meters and above, and he collected whole heap of seed heads and brought them back to the lab. We planted these out in seedling trays outside in the field, gave them a bit of water, uh, just like a garden would, and we let the rain basically supplement so they always remain moist. And what we found was that the fence line population, as soon as you give it water, but that's all it needs to germinate, up it came and in April we basically had complete germination of the brown grass. But the one that came from the same paddock basically does a completely different thing. It sits there right through April, does nothing at all. No germination at all, even though the other one has completely germinated. The germination starts from beginning of May or into mid-May, and then it continues right through into July, and we were even getting a few plants coming up in August. So that is how effective our growers have been at changing the behavior of our own grass. They used to have this in their pastures or on the fence lines, they still have that, but in their crop, they got these populations which basically are coming up a month or two months or three months later. And so, so the power of selection that the management manager has is massive. Okay? So that's, and just to show you visually what these things look like, the seeds virtually look the same. This is one from the fence line. This is in April, autumn time, fence line population, 100% germination, and you can see massive long shoots of brown grass on the field of paper. The same population, but from the paddock, 0% germination. Seeds virtually look the same, but there's no real difference. So massive, massive difference. So the question I guess you really have to ask is that we're giving them good temperature, we're giving them water, what more do they need to germinate, these guys here? And the answer to that is in the next slide, it's a very simple mechanism. They need extended exposure to cold. And in this case, we've given them cold with a very sophisticated technology by sticking petri dishes in the fridge, but you will get that out in the open through just with very low light temperatures. But when you do that, you put them in the fridge continuously at three, four degrees for a week or eight days. The population that showed virtually no germination, you can get it up to about 100% germination through the simple tactic. But the point here is not the seeds are going to be put in the fridge by any farmer, but what it actually explains is that these seeds actually have a requirement for a much longer exposure to cold before they will come up. And that explains why they come up late. In under field conditions. Okay, now, now quickly going on to barley grass, where again we've been seeing the same sort of shift being reported. So again, we wanted to know whether it was simply a geographical thing or whether there was more to it in terms of the management influence. So what we did was, initially this is uh, in 2009, uh, we collected three populations from a peninsula from fairly close, close proximity to one another. This one here is from a farm which is basically uh, the farmer does very little cropping at all, less than 10% cropping intensity. You know, maybe in a very good season he might put a crop, but nine years out of 10 he does not crop. So essentially it is like a pasture and you notice the, the seeds lost their dormancy completely and by April, which is the fourth month of the year, 100% of the seeds would germinate if it rained. Okay. Well, look at these two guys down here, which are the cropping populations from the same area, one only 14K down the road. You basically get no germination, or it's less than 5%. So what is it that these seeds need? And they exactly need the same thing as the brown grass I showed you. They also need that cover. Okay. 
and that's shown in here. They actually need even more coal than brown grass, because in that I showed you what eight days was enough. For barley grass populations, for these ones, to get up to that 90, 100% germination, we needed four to five weeks of sitting in the cold. So what does that mean? It means that these populations will come probably two months later, or even at least a month later than what your pasture populations or your fence line populations would. And that changes, that makes this whole management of these weeds difficult because we know unless the farmer is very perceptive and he's chosen a clear field variety, uh, his options in cereals are very, very limited. And that's why we're seeing quite dirty crops. So then the last thing I want to talk about here, even though we've done a lot of work is, well, how do these populations behave in the field? So what we did was at a single site, so we took four populations and we put them out in the field at Roseworthy. So it's in the same paddock. And what we have done in the paddock is, so we put them out here in early autumn and we let them basically uh, sit there on, on, on the plots and then we planted our lentils on 5th of June. I should also point out here is that this population here, I'll draw your attention to first, is a long-term pasture population. Okay? And it comes from the same farm at Roseworthy as this population across here. The only difference is that this is two paddocks down the road but has been in continuous cropping. And what you notice is that the one that's from pasture, you get a massive germination of barley grass with autumn rains. Virtually all the seed bank has produced plants, and you see very little germination occurring after you seeded the crop. The arrow indicates where we planted our lentils. And you notice virtually nothing came up later. And you contrast that with the other three cropping populations, and you notice that basically most of the barley grass is actually coming up after the planting. So you're getting everything more or less coming up later on, which means you're going to need to have good herbicide options available, otherwise you're going to have a lot of barley grass in your crop. And the other thing I draw here is look at how big a difference can be just on the same farm. But only difference there is that there is different management. This is continuous crop. This is a, a pasture pattern. Okay. So no wonder farmers are seeing all this variable behavior of barley grass on their paddocks because they have managed those paddocks very differently. And that's what's causing that difference. Okay, so the other, only other point I draw from this slide is that we also looked at tillage systems here. Uh, so there are three tillage systems. Uh, we have zip, uh, zero till or the discs, which is up here. No till with knife points or conventional tillage where we gave a couple of calculations. The only point I want to make here is that barley grass is very good at germinating even under zero till. So even when farmers are switching to discs, which some of the farmers are at the moment, it is still going to come up even in bigger numbers than what it did under more traditional systems. Okay, uh, so last one. From the same slide, I'll graph the data now so it perhaps will be easier to grasp from this one. So if you have those population on your farm, this is what it would mean in terms of effectiveness of your lockdown. So all I've given here is the percentage of barley grass which had come up at the time of seeding. So that's the one you're going to kill. Our pasture population, more than 90% had already come up before we planted the crop. So you're going to kill it, you're going to have a very clean crop. And this is a population which is uh, at a place called Owen. Uh, the farmer whose property it comes from is actually here today. I saw him earlier on. His population, we only got 3% germination. Bearing in mind they're all growing together, same, in, same paddock, same climate, everything is the same. So that is the difference. 3% versus 95%. This is how different these populations have become. And no wonder we see different behaviors out in the field and different success of our control tactics. Okay, I'll leave it at that, Mr. Chairman. I won't try and explain how I think it happens, except just to say that just imagine that your population in year one consists of individuals, an odd individual which requires coal, but the majority basically don't require coal. And that's what people had in their pastures before we went into cropping. But those that require coal were at a disadvantage because they're going to come up much, much later. So all their mates are away about a month ahead and they would basically grab all the resources. Simple theory of competition, okay? 
whereas these other guys will remain a minority. But the balance shifts in their favor as soon as the farmer starts to go into intensive cropping, because what he does, he kills the majority, which are the ones that don't require cover. They are basically gone, and that removes the competition for those that have, were the minority, and then they are happy to reproduce, <coughs> and the progeny is there, and that eventually becomes the dominant force in the fields. And that's what we see, mm. Mr. Chairman. Mm. Thank you. Uh, yes, the, the